Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs. I want to welcome you all to tonight's special program. Um, tonight, we're having a panel on black women and the Me Too movement. And tonight's panel is part of a week-long program on the status of black women called Her Dream Deferred, organized in collaboration with the African American Policy Forum. Later this week, we're premiering two plays and having a panel on the role of black women in electoral politics with CNN senior reporter Nia Malika Henderson, Black Lives Matter co-founder Alicia Garza, social justice attorney Barbara Arnwine, California State Assembly member Sydney Kamliger Dove, and moderated by Kimberly Crenshaw. So I hope you will all come back tomorrow night and Thursday night for some of these other super exciting programs. Now, I'm just gonna briefly introduce our guest panelists so we can jump right into the program. Dee Barnes is the former VJ and host of Fox's music video show, Pump It Up, a, national, a nationally syndicated series which included interviews by Dee Barnes with high profile musical guests such as the legendary Curtis Mayfield, Ziggy Marley, Queen Latifah, MC Light, Ice Cube, LL Cool J, and Will Smith. She was also a recording artist who performed with a female group, Body and Soul, on delicious vinyl island records. Kenyette Tisha Barnes is a political strategist, lobbyist, public speaker, trainer, mother, and CEO of Nia Vision uh, LLC, a social justice consulting and political strategy lobbying firm, and the national co-founder of Hashtag Mute R. Kelly. Stephanie Jones Rogers is a professor of history at UC Berkeley, where she specializes in African American history, women's and gender history, and the history of American slavery. She also studies colonial and 19th century legal and economic history, especially as it per pertains to women, systems of bondage, and the domestic slave trade. Jamila Lemieux is a cultural critic and writer with a focus on issues of race, gender, and sexuality. She's a leading feminist thinker, influencer, and media maverick. Lemieux formerly served as the vice president of news and men's programming for I1 Digital, where she helped spearhead the creation of Cassius, a progressive digital lifestyle platform. And she was the senior editor for Ebony Magazine, where she played a key role in launching the publication's website. Rashida Jones is a Grammy-winning actor, director, writer, and producer, who's also an activist and a vocal proponent of increased gender and racial representation in Hollywood. Last year, she directed a PSA in conjunction with Time's Up that breaks down four common questions about sexual harassment in the workplace. Beverly Johnson is a model, actress, and businesswoman. She made history when she rose to fame as the first black model to appear on the cover of American Vogue in 1974. She's also a philanthropist, activist, and vocal supporter of women's rights. Our moderator tonight and the brainchild of Her Dream Deferred is Kimberly Crenshaw, professor of law at UCLA and Columbia Law School. Crenshaw is a leading authority on civil rights, black feminist legal theory, and race, racism, and the law. She's the founding coordinator of the Critical Race Theory Workshop and co-editor of the volume Critical Race Theory, Key Documents That Shaped the Movement. Crenshaw is the co-founder and executive director of the African American Policy Forum, which is a gender and racial justice think legal think tank. And she's the founder and executive director of the Center for Intersectionality and Social Policy Studies at Columbia Law School. So now please join me in welcoming Kimberly Crenshaw, Beverly Johnson, Rashida Jones, Jamila Lemieux, Stephanie Jones Rogers, Kenyette Tisha Barnes, and Dee Barnes. All right, good evening, everyone. So, so excited about this conversation. Is this a conversation that you guys have been waiting to have for a long time? I can tell you from the conversation that we had last night on the telephone that I know this is going to be a conversation that's going to be historic. We have a lot to cover, um, and I'm going to do my best just to set this up and get out of the way because I know that you came to hear what these wonderful, phenomenal women sitting in front of you have to say. So let me get to it. This is a long overdue conversation about an issue that doesn't get the attention it deserves, either in the black community or in the broader community. And that, frankly, is the sexual vulnerability and victimization of African-American women. 
So we know that right now there is attention being paid to the Me Too moment. And some people might think that this is a new conversation. But there is a genealogy to this conversation. So let's start with just some few points in that genealogical uh, tree. Um, Tarana Burke, who couldn't be with us uh, tonight, coined the hashtag Me Too to raise awareness around the question of black women's vulnerability. Before that, Anita Hill told the world her story about what a Supreme Court nominee had done to her as a young lawyer. But it didn't start there. Before that, black feminists like Bell Hooks and Alice Walker put the question of gender-based violence that impacts black women squarely in front of us. And her film, by the way, was picketed um, as being a racist depiction of African-American men. Even before that, Rosa Parks stood up for black victims of racist sexual violence, even before she sat down to protest segregation in public accommodations. So there is a deep history behind this Me Too movement that is all too often erased when the movement becomes part of the political mainstream. And in that process, many of the opportunities that we might be able to live into, step into, to reconfigure how we think about sexual abuse has been erased. So one of the things that AAPF has been committed to for the last several years is lifting up the voices and the experiences of black women, girls, and femmes and also fighting the gentrification of issues like Me Too. So just as a case in point, imagine what our country now would look like if we had believed Anita Hill. Now, I've said this, and I'm going to continue to say it. There's one vote that stood between the Voting Rights Act still being good law and it not being good law. One vote that stands between having real campaign finance reform and not. One vote that stands between this and so many policies that were critical in putting the current occupant of the White House to the White House. So if we had believed this black woman's story, not only would black women be in a better place, the entire nation would be in a better place. So. This is the point of departure for this conversation. We don't want to be asking that question 20 years from now. So in order to make sure that we are able to galvanize this moment to a better future, we wanted to stage this conversation. So joining me now are six phenomenal black women. And let me tell you, um, the depth of their story and their courage um, just, just left me uh, speechless yesterday. So uh, I've gotten back some words now, and we're going to have a great conversation. So let me uh, begin uh, by introducing them. So Beverly Johnson um, is a face that needs no introduction, but the person behind it does. Uh, Barbara Johnson is what, uh, Beverly Johnson is what we fashionistas call royalty. Having secured her perch atop an industry that grants the title of supermodel, to very, very few people. I know you all recognize her. She graced the covers of Vogue, Elle, Glamour, before she was one of the first black women. She was the first black woman to do that. But behind that glamour were some painful realities that she ultimately revealed in her autobiography called The Face That Hanged It All, Changed It All. One bombshell, she too, was among the dozens of women who had a disturbing story to tell about Bill Cosby's predation. And I, for one, am in awe about her willingness to stand up to what many defenders call America's dad. I rooted for her when she told us her choice words for him that I hope we'll hear tonight. <laughs> and um, the spirit of courage that she represents is an inspiration to all of us. So please welcome Beverly. <laughs> Next, Dee Barnes. Now, I can't say I grew up following Dee Barnes because I was a grown-ass woman living in L.A. <laughs> 
when I discovered NWA and its crew. But knowing that there were a few sisters in the bunch gave me an avatar um, to mobilize this new space for me. So when the ugliness went down um, with D, I know I wasn't the only one that wanted to ride shotgun with her and for her. To find out that the trauma didn't stop with the violence that she suffered, uh, but continued um, in many ways to this very moment has been a heartbreaking realization for me. Um, the fist of patriarchy is hard and it has a very long arm. Our goal is to break that arm. And we want to do that and welcome Dee Barnes. Dee, welcome. So for all the sisters who were appalled that R. Kelly's marriage to a 15-year-old Aaliyah barely generated a yawn, for all the sisters who sat increasingly indignant as his career continued to explode, for all of us who sat at birthday parties, weddings, even lectures by prominent male academics as Kelly crooned in the background, for all of us who said someone needs to do something, Kenyette Barnes and Oranike Odeleye are the people who step into that space. They are the sisters we've been waiting for. So with the Mute R. Kelly campaign, these sisters gave organizing muscle behind our indignation, our, our outrage that black women and girls didn't seem to matter to anybody even to ourselves. But stepping up, as they have done, has not been without consequences, and we'll hear about those from Kenyette. It was an absolute pleasure to interview her for our most recent edition of Intersectionality Matters, the podcast, and some of this you'll hear in the next episode of it. And I'm thrilled that she was willing to come across the country to join us here tonight. So please welcome Kenyette. Jamila Lemieux. Now, you know, I used to grow up watching Zena, but I didn't think I'd ever meet her. <laughs> and didn't think I'd meet her in the body of a black woman, but that's her. Uh, Jamila is in it to win it. Now, I, I have to tell y'all, I'm a little new to the Twitter world, so I don't stay on it all the time. I'm on it for a minute, and I jump off. I jump back on. And I will come on, and Jamila will be in the middle of a throwdown with somebody <laughs> who said something stupid, usually misogynoiristic, and she will go toe to toe. Now, I might jump in every now and then and say, get him, sis, but she does not need me to say a daggone thing. Yep. So sometimes I find myself in one of these Twitter wars, and I just ask myself, what would Jamila say? <laughs> So that's something for all of us black feminists and black feminist adjacent people. What would Jamila say? Well, we're going to know what Jamila says. I also want to say that as, as far as a, you know, um, a defining moment in the Bill Cosby situation, Jamila was the driving force behind uh, a cover of Ebony magazine that showed America's dad with a cracked face over it. It was the beginning of the end, I think, in the African American community for this denial. And I have to thank her many times for having the courage to do that. Please welcome Jamila. I'm especially honored to welcome Rashida Jones to the table, who has moved heaven and earth to be with us tonight. Rashida is an actress, writer, and producer, and importantly for this conversation, a leading voice in efforts here in Hollywood to ensure that Time's Up directly engages some of the unique challenges faced by African American women in this industry. As Rashida has said, Hollywood must change and bring every single person along his, who has been marginalized, harassed, and assaulted. Rashida not only talks the talk, but walks the walk, literally leaving a set when the stuff wasn't right. So please give a special welcome to Rashida Jones. And last but not least, history is an essential element in any effort to disrupt the disappearances of black women in the public sphere, in our imaginaries as well. 
one woman who has been tearing up the scripts about the historical complicity of some white women in black women's sexual abuse is the University of California Berkeley Assistant Professor of History, Stephanie Rogers Jones. Now, while it is important not to simply give our, our brothers a pass for looking the other way when they should be down front and up for the cause, it's also important to acknowledge that sexual violence has been something that white women have sometimes participated in against black women as well. So as I said earlier, history is fundamental and we're delighted that we can witness someone rearranging the ABCs of the history of sexual racism in the United States. So please join me in welcoming Stephanie. So I'm gonna get right into it and go first to uh, Beverly Johnson who got us started off yesterday. Um, so one of the observations that yet shared in our uh, interview with each other a couple weeks ago was the way that intracultural, intrafamilial um, solidarities are sometimes used as grooming devices that place black women and girls um, at peril. And much of your story was a story about grooming. So what can you tell us about the grooming that led to the moment of encounter with someone who definitely was not America's dad? Yes. So um, it's a very sad story, and I think for a lot of us, a very disappointing story that a man of his stature could be a monster. And um, like everyone else, I, I love the Cosby Show. Uh, my daughter loved the Cosby Show. And uh, I got that phone call, you know, to come on down. And, you know, there might be a, a, a part on the, on the show for you of a pregnant lady. And uh, I had done some acting before. You know, I did the Martin Lawrence show, and uh, I, I worked with Bernie Mac and a lot of other, you know, comedic actors. And so, of course, I was thrilled. I was thrilled to take my daughter to the taping. And it's not that I didn't feel some little red flags come up, because there was a lot of whisper, 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 when I came in to the studio. And I thought that they were doing that because it's Beverly Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> no, they had a little secret going on. And so I, um, you know, went in and... We saw the taping. I think we came back for another taping, another day. Um, we also uh, came over to his home, my daughter and I, and uh, we met his children and his family. And then he said, you know, we've done all this stuff. Why don't you come back and so we can really audition for the part of the role? Yeah. And, and that's when the assault happened. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I was offered a cappuccino. I don't drink coffee. And he insisted. And I took a little swig of the coffee, and I immediately felt the room spin. And having been a drug addict, alcoholic drug addict, and sober, and now sober for 35 years. Mm. Yes. Thank you. I knew exactly what it was. But I was so, I had just gotten on a very bad divorce. So I had just kicked a brother's behind just recently. <laughs> bad. And, and so I was ready. But I was so incredulous. I was, I, I just looked at him and I just said, you're a motherfucker, aren't you? Mm. I'll never forget the expression on his face. It was like, and then I just began to say the MF word over and over and louder and louder and louder and louder until he eventually just dragged me out and you know threw me in a taxi. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't remember anything else until I woke up the next day. And that was a moment for me. I was very, very angry. I wanted answers, 
And um, I, I, I demand the answer the next day because I did make a phone call and his wife picked up the phone. And I realized that this was a, a war, a fight that you were not gonna win. There were too many people in on it. Mm -hmm. NBC, the producers, the writers, the, the people, the, the cast member, everyone knew but me. So I, I say that to say when 40 years later, or 30 years later when it came up that Constant had this case and I was, you know, very much said, oh my God, I knew it. I knew I couldn't have been the only one. It's just common sense. Mm -hmm. He did it to me. I mean, I'm not special. And so when, it, when I saw these women come out and tell their story and I realized that I had the same story and that by the grace of God, I was not raped, I, I, I just felt that I had to say something. Mm -hmm. And I knew my words in the black community and in, in the world with my platform that I had developed for myself was going to have a, a, a presence. And so that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to you know, underscore some of the dimensions of the grooming or some of the dimensions of making you feel at ease, particularly bringing you to, to the home with your family and his family, right? It's just all us. You know, family folks here, right? So it's one way in which you were made to let your guard down. And then what I, I find interesting is he got angry at you. I think he was shocked that you called it. Because I'm a very nice, sweet, introvert lady. Mm -hmm. Until yeah. he pushed me. Yeah. And he didn't think he was getting a sister girl. Uh... But my niece came out. Oh. And, and I was just, I was okay. just tearing him a new one. So that explains a lot. That explains the pattern, right? That that explains the selection. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. A lot. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, D. So I think hip hop, hip hop fans probably think they know the story, mm -hmm. but they don't know all of it. They don't know all of it. Um, non hip hop fans or People in this generation might not really, they might have a vague recollection, but might not know it. Hip hop has not had its Harvey Weinstein moment yet, right? So some of this is, okay, what's still on the table? What still has not been addressed? So what can you share about how you came to harm's way? And what, what stands out for you about what happened? Okay, um, show of hands, if you guys are familiar with the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? Well, my story is Dr. Dre and Andre Young. Mm. Andre Young is a friend of mine. He was a friend of mine. Big brother, would have followed him anywhere, trusted him. Beverly just blew my mind about the grooming part because I was trying to play in my mind, was I groomed? Mm. Not sure. Um, but we had an intimate relationship as friends. I knew him before NWA when he was part of a group called uh, The Wrecking Crew. So we spent a lot of time together. Uh, I actually saw him uh, be violent. Um, and I didn't stand by as a bystander. I tried to you know, intervene, but... And this is violence against women, other women? Yes, this is but for, uh, for other women. Yeah. Um, how I came into harm's way was during, you know, if you guys are familiar, I would I hosted a show called Pump It Up, which is very like much like uh, Rap City or Yo MTV Raps. It's just a video music show that was on Fox at the time. And we did a sh an interview with the group NWA. Um, by this time, Ice Cube had left the group. So there was a lot of tension there. Now, these were both my friends. And uh, when you sit on the fence, you get shot off for both sides. Um, and I, I was... I was in a position where I had to choose between either supporting Ice Cube in his endeavor or supporting NWA in their endeavor. And I chose not to. I chose to sit on the fence. So it caused more problems. The show was uh, controlled not by me. I wasn't Little Miss Oprah. I was just a host. But I did have a lot of influence in the show. But the producers mixed an interview together, which showed Ice Cube in a rebuttal against NWA and the retribution was on me. They were upset with me because it was a per they felt it was a personal attack because I had known them. And at a record release, so the interview took place um, in 
uh, like October, the year before, 1990. And then the, the interview got shown uh, nationwide in November. And in January, the following January of that year, 1991, hadn't seen the group. Uh, there was a record release party, a Def Jam record release party, full of industry people, uh, lots of drinks, <laughs> free drinks. And um, he was there. Dre was there. Uh, he had a bodyguard there. I showed up at the party late. It was for a group called No Face and Bitches with Problems, which was like mm. the antithesis of um, an NWA. Right. Um, so he saw me at the party and he approached me, but I, I wasn't in fear because I felt he would never do that to me mm-hmm. because I didn't, I wasn't his girlfriend. So that's where the legacy of misogyny takes place, Mm -hmm. in my opinion, in hip hop. Mm -hmm. Because from that moment, what happened to me uh, set off a a series of events that when you look at hip hop now and you see um, that women struggle to come out and tell their stories or there's no really um, consequences for the action of certain rappers, uh, certain R&B singers. Um, for for their abuse, and it's because what happened to me wasn't fully recognized. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was it was a brutal assault. This wasn't, you know, I know it some. Was it in front of people? It was in front of people. If you guys are familiar with recently a video that just came out where this man was kicking this woman on a train, and everybody stood around and watched, mm-hmm. I could relate. Everyone stood around and watched. While no I was one assaulted. stepped in. No one tried. To no do. one. There was one person that stepped in. He he worked for the company. He wound up. He worked for the. He worked for, with them. He tried to step in, and um, he had the bodyguard that was there was holding off people with a gun. So he pistol whipped the guy that tried to help me. Knocked out two teeth. This was brutal. This was not a smack. Um, do you think it was planned? I don't think it was planned. What do they call those? Uh, crime of passion, mm-hmm. the act of rage. Mm-hmm. It was that. It was rage. He had. It was absolute rage that he had um, against me in particular because he felt it was a personal violation that I had um, humiliated him. There's a sense of entitlement there mm-hmm. with a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, hip hop. A lot of, uh, now I won't say hip hop because misogyny is just not in hip hop, it's in it's the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? But with rap in particular, um, there's that fine line of reality, you know, and they were coming with this reality rap. But a lot of it is really just braggadocious. Sure. They're just, you know, making up things, they're just yeah. speaking of things. But this is what happened to me in 1991 is where things crossed the line. In a, in, a, in a major way. And when you say that, what do you mean things cross the line? That that the braggadocia actually yeah. turned into to physical assault. Actually turned into physical assault. Mm-hmm. And people were familiar with his his violence. It wasn't like this wasn't a se- this wasn't an, a known secret. People knew that he was violent. There was other incidents that happened at other record uh, release parties. I'm not going to speak on. Let them speak on it. But an incident happened at Dick Clark's party. Dick Clark, so you can imagine who's there. All the A-list people, nothing happened to him. He assaulted a woman and left there, not in handcuffs, <laughs> not in no jail time. So it was getting to the point where he was feeling that he can get away with anything. And, and apparently he did. Well, when it happened to me, unfortunately, I was the first one to press charges. I knew I wasn't the first, but I wasn't going to be the last. <laughs> was going to be the last. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, to, to end right there. I had to do something because there was no precedence before me, which made it even more difficult. Yeah. You know. And there are some consequences to that that I want to come back to um, in the second round. But I do want to ask you this. A, a lot of us saw um, the uh, hearings in which Dr. Blasey Ford told the story uh, of an attempted assault that uh, now Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh um, was accused of doing. And she said the thing that you know sticks in her memory the most was the riotous laughter between them, right? Mm-hmm. That that was a moment in which she realized that 
the, the damage to her, that what they did to her was completely and totally inconsequential to them. I'm wondering, is there a moment that sticks out in your memory of that moment, that event, that underscores what you were seen to be in his eyes? He said a lot of things to me uh, in the bathroom because at one point I tried to escape and uh, I ran into the women's restroom and he followed me in there. Trapped me in the bathroom. Um, I was on the ground. He had his knee in my chest, uh, foot against the door to keep people from coming in. So he was on top of me. And one of the things that people never ever ask me is, what happened to you in that bathroom? They just assumed that it was just a physical assault. So he said a lot of things that I go into detail in my book, but he said a lot of things he was cursing. And um, that's what sticks out in my mind. The things he was saying to me made no sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it absolutely made no sense. If you guys have recently seen uh, the Defiant Ones where he said he was out of his fucking mind, mm -hmm. he was. Mm -hmm. He was definitely out of his mind. But he knew exactly what he was doing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Woo. So, Kenyette, um, you, you often share that you yourself have not been a survivor of R. Kelly, but um, you've survived your own encounters, and um, your history of challenging R. Kelly goes back like more than a decade. So, talk to us about the trajectory um, of your activism against R. Kelly. As I often tell people, I've been mute in R. Kelly since before Y2K. <laughs> And um, I would say my first act of activism towards R. Kelly was when I was a graduate student at Temple University. And um, I was on the train. They, they call it the L, the elevated train in Philadelphia. And there was a, a, a street vendor selling the bootleg uh, VHS tapes. And I think it was like Top Gun and um, um, some other movies at the time, I think Beverly Hills Cop and some other movies around that time. And to the side was a picture of R. Kelly in like XXX. And they were openly selling the tape. And they were selling it as pornography, as a sex tape. Uh-oh. I know, girl. That's what I, that's exactly what I. That's exactly what happened when I was on the train. That's exactly what happened. That was the ancestors. I wanted, that was the ancestors. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to yank my skirt down so bad, and I couldn't find the right time. To it's all that. good. That was it. It's all good because that's exactly how I felt. So what happened was I was I was on the train going to to Temple, and I saw this street vendor, and I saw the street vendor maybe three times in a week, and the third time, <laughs> I got off the train. It wasn't even my stop. <laughs> got off the train, walked across the street, walked up to the table, and I forearm swiped all the tapes on the ground. So, right, I, th there was no plan, there, there was no, we didn't think about this, there were no signs. So just swiped the tapes on the ground. And the vendor looked at me as if I had done something wrong. Like, you know, are you crazy? What's wrong with you? And I think I said, you goddamn right I'm crazy. Now here is me like a 20-something-year-old grad student. I had like a, a five-foot Afro puff, and I, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend anyone doing that. Now, way. <laughs> and at that point, I just sort of walked away, got back on the train, used another token. You all are students. That's real activism. If you're going to use another <laughs> token, because I was going the same direction. And when I was sitting on the train, I felt vindicated. But I was also angry. And then it re-triggered my own experience with child pornography. So to the story, when I was a teenager, I was a model. So that was going to be my career, which is why I'm totally fangirling Beverly over here. Because I remember that Vogue cover. I remember that. And I was going to be the next Beverly Johnson. I was going to be, you know, the next black supermodel. That was my dream. 
And part of what you do as a model is you keep your portfolio updated. And you tend to have some sort of a formal look, some sort of a casual look, and maybe a swimsuit or a leotard so that, you know, you know, people can see kind of what your body looks like. So when I was in the mall, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, so this was in Cleveland, someone approached me and said he was a photographer. Once again, we talk about grooming. Mm -hmm. A lot of pedophiles, predators will sort of insert themselves into these industries where they know they have access to vulnerable young women. Fast forward, so I went to the photo shoot, and a, then maybe an hour into the shoot, I realized that this was not a shoot at all, and this was actually a pornography shoot. So here I am at 17 years old, completely groomed to believe that I'm here to just model, and I find myself in very compromising positions, not understanding how I got there, why I'm there, and then in some way, I brought this on myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so after the, the, the proofs had come back, I remember maybe half of them were missing. Mm. And I never saw the pictures that he had taken. So back, this is in the 80s, so back in the 80s, there were underground child pornography, you know, rings, and they would share, is that me? They would share the picture. So at this point, you know, there are probably 50 or something images of 17-year-old Kenyette's genitals, you know, and I have no idea where they are. So when the R. Kelly tape came out and people were diminishing it, as a sex tape, and I've often like flamed on social media about that, it sort of triggered me. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of is my personal mm -hmm. commitment to this work. Kenyette, I, I was struck uh, on, on our interview, you, you talked about um, the culturally specific modalities of grooming, right? So, so we know about the modeling and, and all, all of those. So those are kind of across the board. But there were elements of it that were, were, were specific, right, designed to make you feel mm -hmm. that you were with, you know, you were with family. Mm -hmm. so, so describe some of that stuff that was like in the studio and like what, oh, what wow. the feel was. Oh you, oh, you mean the velvet paintings of like <laughs> Malcolm X? And yeah. yeah, so I walk into the studio and it really looked like this, like we use the term woke now. Yes. And I mean, you know, you have pictures of Malcolm X and MLK and that picture of MLK and, and, um, and, you know, um, Jefferson, not mm -hmm. Jefferson, uh, K thank you, Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was like, okay, you know, this guy seems like he's pretty legit. But what I didn't notice, what well, I noticed, but I didn't see it as an issue, was in the corner were pictures of other young women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't make the connection until after. So, yeah, I walked into the studio. I wasn't. He didn't have hooks from the ceilings and, you know, <laughs> gag balls or anything like that. It looked like this guy was legitimate. Mm -hmm. And I think the fear in grooming is that the predator is going to put on the mask of the most benevolent person that you could ever think that yeah. they are. Yeah. And that's part of the grooming process. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jamila, as I said, you are in it to win it. Um, every day, <laughs> you're out there, um, you know, pushing back um, in, in a real um, significant way. And, and a lot of us are just glad you're doing it because, I mean, the energy that it takes to, like, stare that stuff down um, is, is just, um, we know it has to come from some deep commitment. So what is it in your... Um, uh, personal orientation towards this that you think is your point of departure, why you are motivated, what shapes your determination to push back against this kind of misogyny? You know, I was raised by uh, activist parents. My father was a Black Panther. My mother was active with SNCC. And, you know, there was this foundation of just awareness of who I was as, as a black person or as a little black girl and black is beautiful and 
these are the experiences of our ancestors and these are the things we have to do to honor them and you know these are the things we've been denied in this country and I think that for all of their best efforts what was largely missing um, was a centering of the experiences of black women and girls. Mm -hmm. And when I was around middle school and you know, I always was a big reader and, and going from the Babysitter's Club to, oh, 18 Pine Street, there's a book about with little black teenage girls on the cover, discovering that nonfiction section, you know, and, and saying, wait, these things I'm feeling inside, I didn't make that up. You know, discovering bell hooks and reading Joan Morgan and, you know, Honey Magazine and, and Old School Essence Magazine, right? And, and listening to black women that did not feel unfamiliar or that they were so, they were accessible, right? Like, and, and including black women scholars, I, I think in ways that other people with you all's level of education and training uh, are not. Right, and they were speaking straight into my heart. This idea that black women have been disenfranchised, not just on the basis of our race, but also on the basis of our gender, and that we can experience that at home, the proverbial home in our community, right? And I looked around and, and I had no interest in engaging in church because as I saw black women flocking to enter these kind of unhealthy, unbalanced relationships with these spiritual leaders that come in and represent the father, that represent the partner, that represent certain things that are absent from their lives and promising us that milk and honey comes to us on the other side, mm -hmm. right? And that our lives are designed to, you know, that, that we are the mules, that we suffer, that we carry the load for everyone in our families, in our communities, for our employers, um, for white folks in general. And I never believed that that was the way that I wanted to live. So you know, Bill Cosby and R. Kelly are two uh, individuals that I have been particularly passionate about calling out and holding uh, people accountable for not being willing to, I think, reasonably engage with the facts and all the information that's available. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the experiences that women and girls have with those two men are not like my own experiences with sexual violence. Uh, but I was able to see them with very clear eyes and did not want to live in a world where that was okay. I mean, my, I take issue with the idea that my blackness is less significant than that of our brothers. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean not holding space for them, not loving them, not supporting them, but that we've stood in solidarity with them from the moment that we arrived here, but we have not always been able to count on any sort of reciprocity, you know, specific to our issues that are tied to our gender identities, right? And that that has been extended to our LGBTQ family, right? And so when we're talking about what black people need in the black community and black righteousness and black thought and black power, it can't only be cis het black manhood that we're talking about. Uh, and it's difficult to hold up a mirror to disenfranchise people, especially people who have been as disenfranchised as black men are, you know, that have been as abused as they've been abused and who've been as maligned as they've been maligned and say, you can be complicit in doing the same thing to me, mm -hmm. right? It, it, that's a hard thing to swallow. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that a lot of them can and will mm -hmm. and are recognizing that mm -hmm. and, you know, if the rest of them don't, we're not going to, we're going to be having this conversation sure. in 10 years, in 20 years, in 30 years, and I don't want us to keep having the same conversation. And, and, and part of the hard thing to swallow about it is that um, I think we as women um, find it difficult to speak about things that might be written into a stereotypical narrative about our families, about our men, about our relationships. You said something in, in our conversation that actually made me even, you know, think differently um, about the entire uh, spectrum of discourse about sexual abuse. So um, to the extent that there is a hierarchy, shall we say, about some of the worst things that could happen to a woman, um, usually what's at the top of that hierarchy is the idea of, you know, stranger rape, right? Someone who jumps out of the bushes, um, and effectively the law kind of supports that idea. Like if you don't know the person and, and it was a chance encounter, uh, the tendency is to believe survivors of that kind of abuse more than if you knew the person or if you dated the person 
or if you were married to the person or related to the person. So there, there's been this hierarchy. Um, and you suggested that perhaps when we think about what's happening within our communities and having to deal with the history of, of our need to protect our communities and our men, that maybe we need to think about that hierarchy a little differently. So share what you think about that. Yeah, I, um, I was uh, sexually assaulted. I was raped when I was about 22. Uh, I was in living in the D.C. area, preparing to move to New York, where I've lived uh, for the past 12 years ever since. And there was this mask. There was a gun. I, you know, would not have been able to identify that person in a lineup, you know, if I tried. And these are the circumstances, again, for the rape that we, we mm -hmm. so many people think is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. I think for me, I feel almost a sense of relief. One, knowing that one in three uh, women who look like me will have this experience at some point in their lifetime. I think I'd always accept it. And prior to knowing that statistic, that's something I learned as an adult, you know, but I think even as a teenager, somewhere in me was like, and, and I forget the writer who wrote these exact words, but I read it maybe in like a Jezebel article and it really resonated with me that when she was being sexually assaulted, she thought to herself, okay, well, here's my rape almost as if I've been waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And so I think I had sort of, you know, it's not something that I gave a lot of thought to prior to it happening. And it's certainly, it's honestly not something I've given a lot of thought to after it happened because there was a part of me that was like, well, this was pretty much bound to happen. You know, statistically it was gonna, you know, if you put you and your two best friends in a room, one of you all was gonna have this experience. Maybe I was the one who was tough enough to handle it, right? Maybe luckily it was me because I wasn't dealing with some of the triggers and issues or, you know, childhood sexual trauma that some of my sister girls were also living with. Um, but the fact that it was a stranger, I think brings me a sense of comfort and relief because I didn't have to bear the load of this person is beloved, say in my family. You know, this is one of my friends. This is, you know, somebody's frat brother or a member of a church that I go to or, you know, someone famous, an activist, a professor, a musician. You know, this wasn't somebody that I knew anything about. So I didn't have any emotional attachment to him. I didn't have to worry about defending myself against what he'd done to me uh, when I described it to other people because this person, you know, was part of a protected class, you know, so he's going to get this level of... Uh, defensiveness, right? That I'm gonna have to fight really hard to prove that this happened to me. Now that's not to say that I had a good experience with the Prince George's County Police Department um, and the detectives that were responsible for handling it. And I was treated like a suspect, like so many uh, rape victims are. I had to answer a lot of questions about where I was and why was I there and you know, the, the detective actually said to me, you know, sometimes someone may lose some money because you know, he robbed me, gambling, or maybe they overspent, and they may come up with something like this to tell their families so that they're not embarrassed. And he says this to me within hours of the attack. We're not talking about, there were no weeks of interrogation. That was it. You know, I don't think I ever spoke to him again. I got a call from the Maryland Rape Crisis Center checking on me three or four months later, because I remember I was walking down Marcus Garvey Boulevard in Brooklyn. I was like, well, a good thing I am okay. <laughs> like, well, what was the plan? What exactly were you doing? What were you waiting for? Right. You know? Um, but so with that, I, I often think about when a black woman is raped by someone who looks like her, having to think about if I involve law enforcement, one, I can't say that they have my best interest in mind. Regardless of who the, the person who's harmed me is, I, don't, I can't say they have my best interest in mind. I can't say that they're going to believe me or support me. And then I have to think about, this is one of my brothers, what are they going to do to him? Mm -hmm. And then what are the people in our community going to say? Who are they going to believe? Who are they going to stand with? And so that I didn't have to grapple with that part, um, I think has made it easier for me to deal with this. But I've had to deal with that as somebody who's empathetic to what R. Kelly's uh, victims have been through. Someone's been empathetic to what Bill Cosby's victims have been through. Uh, and I've been privileged to have a platform and I was a magazine editor for a while and I write and I tweet too much. <laughs> And, um, not too much, not too much. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm happy to, to hold space, to, to be the, the warrior who takes the scholarship 
that you all have produced, right? And the experiences that you all have shared and the activism yeah. that you have done. And so I can get in front of these, don't, you all don't worry about these clowns. Let me handle them, you know? <laughs> because the people that are watching those exchanges are the ones that are, can be impacted. The young girl who's on the fence, or like, I don't really know how I feel about this Me Too stuff, or I'm not really sure when, you know, I thought that Dr. J was, or I thought, you know, when they hear, folks that have the, the punchlines and the quick wit and also the ability to make this stuff really clear and easy to them. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully the, the generation coming behind mine will not, again, so, tolerate. So I, 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 want to, I want to just follow up real quickly and, and, then, and then hear from Rashida and, and Stephanie about this beloved problem because um, all, all three of you have been involved in um, bringing down beloved people. One of the things that I find shocking, and, and I'll, I'll start by saying this, when um, we were representing, supporting Anita Hill, we came out of the Capitol one night and, and saw all these black women there. And we thought, the brigade has come. You know, the reinforcements are here. They're here to give some love to the sisters. So we sort of walked over to them, and as we approached them, we saw they had T-shirts on that were like, you know, support Clarence Thomas. They were praying and singing praise songs, asking God to come and intervene, basically strike down this Jezebel who was trying to bring down, you know, Clarence like, Thomas. Yeah. I think that was the moment that something in me broke. I mean, something that I've never really been able to recover. Perhaps it was an illusion that I didn't need to have. So to say I'm disillusioned at looking at reality might be a good thing. But I'm thinking that with each of you, there probably was a moment when you were like, oh, damn, you too, right? Um, you know, sister, so sometimes I don't really think it's that um, you, you weren't believed. It was like it didn't matter what happened. So I'm wondering, you know, just real quick thoughts about what do you make of the fact that some of the most, you know, um, in, in, on the ground to the mat supporters of Cosby, of Dre, you know, of Kelly, mm -hmm. are sisters who look just like us. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and famous yeah. sisters. Yeah. And, and sisters that have a huge platform. Yes. There were crickets when mm -hmm. I came out about Cosby. And I tried to warn them. I said, don't do this interview because it's true, because he did it to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to end up with egg on your face. Mm -hmm. And they ended up with egg on their face. Mm -hmm. It's and Do you think they didn't believe you? Or economically, politically, for all other reasons, they're too tied up, like you were saying a little bit about what was happening in the hip hop industry? Yeah, it, I think, too, with people, and, and especially in our, with R. Kelly, it's like, uh, people side with the money, mm -hmm. the money, yeah. the money. <laughs> it's the money because you now you messing with my money, right? Because I work, I'm associated with this person. That's why they're surrounded by the enablers. Um, mm -hmm. And the women, it's just like, for example, with me, uh, Dre's um, record company at the time, or Suge, Suge Knight, hired a female, a black woman lawyer to tear me apart you yeah you know what I mean so that they can show well look this woman is supporting this guy he can't be that bad um and and Beverly you were sued right right and, and I was sued and and sometimes I feel that a lot of the women that are in denial there's been some abuse there Mm. And if they recognize your abuse, they have to recognize their own. Right. Yep. And they're not willing to go there. Right. Yes. Because right. it's too right. it's too dark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I'm I'm also seeing um playing out certain images of black women in our own community that we have internalized. So I think in a lot of these circumstances, it's not that the the, the women involved don't know that he's that these guys are violent or predators. It's an assumption that it's not going to come back to us, which means that there is sort of like, oh, well, there's there's a certain kind of girl that that happens to. I was in that space. Right? Yeah, I was in, yeah. in that space because because I was in proximity. 
you know, on this side of the fence. Uh, and I, I never thought it would happen to me. That was my headspace, and you know, it would happen to them. I'm not like that, or um, you know, they put themselves in that position, or you know, I'm his little sister, which is still mind-boggling to me listening to Beverly because I was like, was I groomed? You know, I'm uh, just 28 years later. I'm thinking about was I groomed because we were in a intimate relationship, and I trusted him completely. Mm-hmm. You know what? I, I think we were all groomed. Mm. I think black women have been, we're grown from girlhood to be, at, you know, the water carriers, the helpmates, the comfort, you know, like just to provide nurturing and support and solidarity and, and silence. And, silence. And, silence. Mm-hmm. and it's one thing to not be able to get that in return, right? To see that when we're victims of racist violence and abuse and, and sexual violence from other people that we don't always get what we deserve from our own folks. But... The idea that we must be, if we are not complicit with violence against us that happens within our community, that we are on the side of our oppressors, that we are working in in cahoots with the state to harm our men. Right, right. Well, let me bring um, Rashida and Stephanie into the conversation. So, you know, we've we've basically been talking about asymmetric solidarity, you know, More is expected of us. We expect more of us than comes back to us. Um, And we've been talking about narrative erasures. Some part of that has to do with what's available. Some part of it has to do with what goes on in this industry right out here. Um, And so you're part of Time's Up, uh, Women of Color. You all have been looking at workplace issues around gender harassment, inequality, and as um, one of the one of the figures in that movement dealing with this issue on behalf of and with through the lens of black women, what are some of the ways that Time's Up has been talking about and grappling with black women's challenges in this industry? Well, first I, I just want to say um, thank you to you all for telling your stories. I'm I'm so moved and um and I, I've heard some of them before, but I think every time you tell them in a public space, it allows other people to hold space for their stories. Yes. Be brave themselves, be honest themselves, to be vulnerable and strong at the same time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's nothing ever changes without these stories. Nothing will ever move without these stories. Um, so that's the beginning of everything, right? And then, the, the rest is such a complex system. The things that have made black women feel like they have to hold space for black men over themselves. The, the, the heavy burden of race and gender. Um, the, the feeling of dismissal, the low expectations of what's possible, um, how big the dream can be. So, you know, at Time's Up, again, it's like these movements, as you mentioned, Dr. Crenshaw, there's always an inflection point. And so many inflection points that are started by black women are missed. D in hip hop, Anita Hill in politics. And I do believe there is some version of this country and our lives that would be different if people listened to black women. <laughs> um, and I've, and you know, because we didn't want Time's Up to be a white woman's movement, <laughs> um, you know, a few people spoke up and said, hey, there's, there's very particular issues to women of color and even more particular to black women that need to be addressed. Um, and I personally believe there's no success without that. There just isn't. Um, so in, in preparation in protection to not have the movement co-opted, you know, we kind of created a, a smaller group to really address the issues that are very particular to black women. Some of those issues being representation, which I know you deal a lot with, um, colorism, um, access, um, stereotypes. Um, and so really, I think for us, we're still trying to figure out the best way to attack all of those things from the inside because it's about power and capital and how can we take our stories and our strength and the strength that we've held for other people for so long uh, and turn it on ourselves and support each other. And the first time we all showed up, it was so crazy because we had all been siphoned off for so long because everybody was, cr- you know, mm. competing for the, w- the the wife, 
So none of us knew each other. We all felt competitive with each other. And just to sit in a room, the power of sitting in a room and to not have other people dictate why we are somewhere was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. And now we're in contact, like nothing can get by us. Like we're a, we're a barrier where we're like, hey, did you hear about that thing? And how much did they offer you on that so that we can check in with each other and look out for each other first? So we're hoping to expand that, create more access, create more opportunities so that if there are black women in the room making decisions, this is less possible, you know. If there's, there's, there will be less silence that that is expected from black women around, especially around black men, mm -hmm. around any men. Um, so black women to feel like their their voices are valid. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of just at the beginning, and we're experimenting and figuring it out. But I'm I'm hoping that this this moment in time is not a moment, and it's the beginning and it's continuous, and that this conversation, because unfortunately, as all of you have said, these are not rare occurrences. Mm -hmm. This is not the, the, you know, the only five, four people you will hear talking about this. Mm -hmm. This is a common occurrence. And, there's, and we, as, a, as a, a society, are responsible for that. That's, it's a crisis, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder what you can share um, with the audience about where the absences are of, of black women in the industry. So um, some things we have access to and we can see and other things sort of behind the scenes in terms of mm -hmm. who has narrative authority, who determines um, what stories get told and what stories don't. So one thing that we just stumbled on is a statistic that said um, it for the last 10 years, none of the 10 highest paid actresses in, in, in the industry have been black. It's been more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's not actually the same thing that's happening on, you know, with our brothers, right? Mm -hmm. We have brothers who are mm -hmm. in the top 10. It's not as though, you know, it's Shangri-La at all. Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, everyone competing for that wife, you know, everybody competing for, you know, the sassy sister who comes on and says something mm -hmm. and goes immediately off. You know, that is, that is creating a vacuum um, which makes it all the more likely that that person, that juror who showed up on, on, um, in Dream Hampton's documentary saying, you know, those black women, you know, I didn't like anything they had to say. I didn't like the, the way they dressed. I didn't like the way they talked. I dismissed everything they had to say. So there is a relationship mm -hmm. between what, how we get represented and not, Absolutely. and whether we believe what kind of women we're seen as being. So who's making those decisions? Where do black women need to be? Well, there, they need to be there because they're not making those decisions because they wouldn't make those decisions for, for the most part. And you know, it's systemic and we're seeing it all over the country. It's been mainly, you know, white, het, cis males making decisions for a really long time, it's systemic. Um, the good news is that everybody in Hollywood is so scared. <laughs> They're so scared. And we have employed the very, very um, powerful device of shame. Um, we walk into rooms and say, and show them their numbers and say, is this really, this is what your studio looks like? This is what your network looks like? You know that doesn't represent the demography of this country, right? You know you're gonna lose viewers because you're not representing the people who wanna watch your shows. You have an audience out there. And again, back to money, there's money. There's money in the community, so like, if, if we're being mercenary about it, sometimes we'll say, you're missing an opportunity. And if we're, if we're being emotional about it, we'll say, you know, shame on you for not, for not having opportunities. So there, there is starting to become a bit more momentum in terms of people wanting to um, get creators, black female creators in the room, to tell their stories from the ground up, to populate the room with people who understand the stories. If you go to an agency or studio and you hand them a script about you know, your experience and you know, you're a black woman in this country and there's no black women in that room, nobody's gonna buy that script. Mm -hmm. if there's one black woman, they might say, oh, hold on, I relate to that. And I think a lot of people will relate to that. So it's about populating the, to the top positions and making sure that black women ha or have access to that power. 
and and then using our our consumerism to reinforce that right so yes. we need to know which studios don't have Show black up. women in yes. the room because we have money mm -hmm. right we just aren't really clear mm -hmm. about how to spend it and how not to spend it right. so perhaps one thing that comes out of you know these conversations is more information to black women about you know how to consume I want to go to, to you, Stephanie, because we, we've been talking about things that um, do have a historical backdrop. Um, this last conversation in particular has been about the challenges of building a multiracial, you know, sort of movement against uh, violence against women. And typically the story is, well, our coalitions aren't always as strong as they could be. We don't always stand up, or we don't see white women standing up for the various ways that black women experience it. But it's basically been a narrative of not the best ally. Your research tells us that there is a much deeper problem historically in the way that some white women have been complicit in sexual violence against black women. So what can you share? Absolutely. So I am a historian of slavery and I explore um, white women's economic investments in the institution of slavery and particularly look at women who owned slaves. And I tell that story by looking at the testimonies of formerly enslaved people. So what did they have to say about white women's deep investments in the economy of American slavery and their continued subjugation? And so as a part of that research, um, I started to ask myself, well, if women are, white women are exercising um, power as slave owners in all of these various ways that formerly enslaved people are telling us they were, um, were they also deeply invested in the kind of sexualized economic dimensions of slavery? Um, and by that I mean, um, we think about white men as either the perpetrators of uh, sexual violence against enslaved women. We also think about perhaps them as the orchestrators of circumstances in which sexual violence could in fact occur. Um, but were white women also orchestrating um, circumstances in which um, enslaved women um, would be subjected to sexual violence. So I looked to what formerly enslaved people had to say, and formerly enslaved peoples had to say exactly that. They said they were, in fact, um, not simply complicit, but arbiters, um, orchestrators of circumstances in which enslaved women were being assaulted um, by, by white men, but also by um, other enslaved people. So these were kind of um, instances of sexual violence that involved both enslaved women and men. Um, and there's a story um, of a woman named Henrietta Butler. She was enslaved in Louisiana. And so in 1940, this woman, Flossie McElwee, she, she worked for the federal government and she sat down with Henrietta to ask her you know, about her experience in slavery. And so I'm reading this and I'm saying okay so I'm, I'm I'm reading these kind of this litany of horrors that Henrietta experienced and I'm waiting for um, the moment in which she identifies the perpetrator of these acts of sexual violence which she describes and so I was shocked to realize that she wasn't talking about a white man she was talking about a white woman her owner Emily Haiti who had um, essentially forced her to have sex with an enslaved man and when they would have children she would sell the boys and keep the girls and continue the process so she would continue to force these enslaved females to, to, to have sex with men that weren't of their choosing and have children by these men. And she, it was an economic calculation. So from that, what I, what I take from that is um, that there are circumstances in which white women understand that they're oppressed because of their gender identities, but they can exercise and wield an extraordinary power because of their racial identities. And some women choose their racial identity. They choose white supremacy when it comes to deciding whether to ally with women across the color line and to fight in a multicultural alliance with other women um, and combat um, sexual violence or to ally with, with white men and to wield the benefits that come with white privilege and white supremacy. So, so. So that you know, I think I think the tendency um, among some of our our white sisters um, is to um, distance anything in this contemporary moment from that terrible history. Mm -hmm. um, and and one can understand that, right? No, no one wants to to live in that shadow. But there is also something called truth and reconciliation. Yes. So if we're to move forward with a movement that understands and centers this history, 
what does that look like? What does truth and reconciliation mean? What does it do for our capacity to actually have a full, robust sort of Me Too moment that doesn't erase that stuff, but actually lets us see what we need to do differently and how we talk about these issues? Well, I think that many white women who, who want to ally themselves with uh, women of color and cross, you know, across the color line to fight against sexual violence and sexual harassment um, in the Me Too movement um, often are trying to reckon with white privilege. And a lot of them, um, I think, think about white privilege in economic terms. But I think many of us see examples all around us that white privilege can manifest in ways that aren't economic at all, like calling the police and being believed when you tell them that an African-American person is doing something they, don't, they, they shouldn't be doing or in a space where they shouldn't be. So we can see the ways in which white privilege manifests and the ways in which white women seize opportunities um, because of their racial identity. But those individuals who are truly willing to do the work of reckoning with white privilege and understanding the benefits that come with whiteness, um, I think can ask themselves, this is what I would ask them to do. If you're in a room, if you're in a space that, that's an exclusionary space in which um, women of color, marginalized women are, are not a part of that space, they're not a part of those conversations, are you being an ally when there are no marginalized women in the room? And if you can't answer in the affirmative, then you need to really reevaluate your, ident your self-identification as an ally. Because when you are in those spaces, are you um, magnifying the voices of enslaved, uh, of, of not enslaved women, but of free women, <laughs> of marginalized women? Um, I'm thinking historically, of course. Um, are you um, making sure that when you're in those spaces um, and marginalized women are not in those spaces, that you center their stories, that you name them, that you tell, that, that you talk about the strategies that they are using to combat sexual violence in their communities and sexual harassment in their communities? What are you doing with your privilege? Because the reality is this, this is a racially divided social order in society and white privilege is real and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. But what are you doing with your white privilege? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so my question would be, that is, you know, reckon with that, that, ask that question. So, so there we have, you know, a step. So we're, we're going to um, turn to some audience questions in a few seconds, but there are a few sort of cleanup questions I want to ask some folks. So, um, and yet, I, I want to um, help people understand what this adultification of black girls contributes to our understanding of how this predatory behavior towards black girls mm -hmm. that R. Kelly perpetrated was able to go on for so long with virtually no significant intervention. So um, as I was sitting up here looking at my phone, I was not reading Jamil's tweets. I wanted to. However, I was actually looking for responses, messages that I received simply because of my position in this space that were very vitriolic and touched on the idea of adultification. So that's what I was doing. So I have a few. So if I have some time, I want to read some of these to you all. And um, But what adultification does is it allows for black girls to want to be seen as more physically, emotionally, psychologically, and sexually precocious beyond their chronological years. And I often say in spaces where I'm attempting to educate both black men and others Maturity and precociousness are not the same. So we gotta be clear about that. Number two, the other thing that adultification does is it takes away that natural protection that we give to children. We hold space for children because we understand that they don't understand what's going on. They're not mature enough. Children can't drive at a certain age because we understand that there's a developmental um, deficiency there. We protect kids. When kids come to us crying, we go out and we find the person who hurt them. That doesn't happen for black girls. One of the things that happened with this campaign that breaks my heart is this idea that we keep using the term sex tape. And about 2 a.m., I, I, I got up and I just kept reading and hearing sex tape and sex tape. And I had, I 
felt like I had to do something. I had another Temple University swipe the tapes moment, but I did not swipe the tapes. And so I fired off a tweet and I said to media, stop using the term sex tape. So if you've noticed, and I hate to say that I've done something, but if I could, if there's like an actionable thing that happened, you don't hear the term sex tape anymore as much as you used to. Part of that was because I, I had to find myself educating journalists. Hey, you're adultifying these girls by using the term sex tape. Last week I was on headline news on a live broadcast, live, and uh, one of the attorneys that was sort of Skyped in from New York mentioned sex tape. And I saw the term sex tape on the prompter, because if you're sitting on the stage, you can actually see the prompter. Like, you all don't see it. The audience doesn't see it, but you can see it if you're a guest. And as it was scrolling up, and I saw her reading, and I saw sex tape. And I think my temperature raised about 10 degrees, like sitting in the seat. And she was talking, and I said, um, can I just have a minute? Less than a minute, 10 seconds. Uh, we have to stop using the term sex tape. We have to. So this was a live broadcast. Like, headline news is not only in the United States, it also broadcasts in Canada. And in that moment, I felt like I was standing up for those 14 and 15-year-old girls who had their sexual, their, their pubescent sexuality adultified for not only the predators, but also in the media, by people who were supposed to be safe people. And I, I mean, I don't know what happened with that. They called me back, so clearly they weren't too pissed off. But um, adultification for me is one, we look at these girls as older than they are, and then we don't protect them. And you know, one of the consequences of the adultification of black women and, and black girls is that they're more vulnerable to trafficking. So one of the things yes. that um, it has been part of uh, this week of Her Dream Deferred, we had a town hall on Saturday, uh -huh. and we had two African-American girls who testified about being trafficked from like the age of 10. Mm -hmm. And um, what we learned was, number one, uh, many times they're preferred yeah. by traffickers, number one, because they know the police don't really care that much. Mm -hmm. They don't tend to get involved. And then in some states, of course, the whole point of, you know, uh, being underage is that you, you're not supposed to be able to consent to sex. Exactly. But when girls, black girls disproportionately, are being prosecuted exactly. for prostitution, exactly. that is legalized adultification. Exactly. We're not going to treat them like the children that they are. And one of the things I'm curious about is what does that sound like inside of our community? And what's the history of that? Because I'm wondering if it goes all the way back to the fact that breeding us had to be justified in some way. Mm -hmm. So was it justified by basically saying, well, they're not children anyway? And, and what does it sound like when in our own communities we say these kind of things about girls? What's some of the language of adultification that happens at home. So first on the history, is there any histor historical dimension to this? Absolutely. So there's a, a court case that I think is, is a perfect example of this. There was a, an enslaved man who sexually assaulted a female, an enslaved girl. And so he was charged with sexual assault and the, the courts eventually ruled that it wasn't rape because a slave couldn't rape a slave. But I think Embedded in that is also this idea that enslaved girls were never really enslaved girls. They were enslaved women. And you can see that language emerge in lots of discussions um, in, the, in that moment, but also in the documentation that historians like myself look at. These young girls are called women. In, in, the, in, in the text. So I think that language is very much. And I, and I think we hear it sometimes in our own community, little women, um, sometimes you know, little mama. Um, if, if a girl says that something's happened to her, we tend to say, well, she was fast. She brought it on herself. You know, I think we might not she realize. She shouldn't wear this, shouldn't she, wear yeah. that. And I think we might not realize that we're actually bringing forward, you know, ideas about our sexual uh, availability that go all the way back to slavery. We might be not conscious about how we're reproducing that. Um, 
Dee, I want to come back to you because we've talked about how um, the repression of black women's voices talking about saying um, what has happened to us and, and demanding accountability can be a long-term continuing um, source of insecurity, mm -hmm. financial insecurity, mm -hmm. safety insecurity, emotional insecurity. Mm -hmm. So this happened a long time ago. Yes. Have you gotten to a point where it still, it no longer impacts you or does it actually extend to this very day? You know, that, that question is, is this is great because I'm trying to figure out the answer for that myself. It's an ongoing thing. But I think one of the factors for me in particular is that eight years after the incident, the song Guilty Conscience came out. And, and tell people about that. Guilty Conscience is a song that was produced by Dr. Dre um, featuring Eminem. And they mention my name. They mention um, uh, the line is, which I have to hear for the rest of my life, by the way. Music is forever. Um, so this was some type of punishment for me as a reminder look what I did to you I got away with it and they say um, when the song was being produced that supposedly Dre fell off his chair laughing when they did the song but for me it's a it's a constant it's a emotional abuse it's a daily reminder of it so I'm not sure if that song hadn't come out would things have died down for me not sure about that but because that song came out eight years after, you know, trying to live my life, going on with myself, uh, raising my, my, my children. At the time, I had a five-year-old daughter who heard the song, knew who I was, and I had to explain to my five-year-old daughter what it meant, because she, she heard it. She was smart. Mom, why are they saying that about you? And I, I remember trying to shut the radio off when the song came on, and I couldn't. She heard it. I had to pull over. I cried, because now I've got to explain to my daughter you know, five beautiful years I've had, no, you know, the innocence is gone on, on that particular subject. I've had um, jobs, it's been hard for me to work. Uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar, if you're on Twitter right now, I'm actually homeless. I was evicted because it's been very hard for me to work. I had like regular jobs. I've worked for H&M, <laughs> Forever 21, TJ Maxx. Uh, I applied for Trader Joe's, like all kinds of just Nine to five jobs with, you know, great people. Usually I get on there. No one knows anything. Sometimes two months, three months, sometimes two weeks, they figure it out. I've had supervisors who told me I'm a fan of Ice Cube. I've had supervisors who actually put the m, &M tape on my desk. So it's like a, a form of harassment. Now, you know, what am I going to do? Uh, sue the company? Possibly, I could I could have done that, right? But am I going to sue everybody? Am I going to be in court all the rest of my life? I got to keep it. I got to keep it moving, you know. So I think that that song in particular has um, has like put the thumbprint on me, sealed the deal, so to speak. That it's not going to be uh, an easy thing for me to to continue on because at some point, at some time. You know, if you look on Twitter, I get it at least a hundred times a day. You're gonna take advice from somebody who slapped D Barnes, and I never was slapped. He didn't slap me not once. I was punched. I was kicked. I was stomped on. You know, and had all kinds of vile things said to me, and done to me, but it wasn't a slap. And I and I believe that the song came out to um to control the narrative. Yes. To and control yes. the narrative and, and to, to be, minimize and to humiliate. Humiliate. I mean, that was big time humiliation. Like, uh. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to answer that question, um, it's an ongoing process for me. You know, I get a lot of support. I get also a lot of backlash, mm -hmm. a lot of backlash. So, so you know, we, we've been talking about how to retake um, this Me Too moment, putting black women back in the middle of it. I don't think our work can be done as long as Dee Barnes is homeless. Thank you. I, 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 just I was just think thinking this the same possible. thing. <laughs> this is not possible. As long as Dee Barnes does not have a career, as long as Dee Barnes has to consistently recognize that the long-term consequences are actually physical, they're real. 
that that's the challenge for us. And and I, I personally don't want another day to go by where I have to even think about the fact that you're still suffering those consequences. So it, it is it is my hope that this is the beginning of encircling Me us, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, it's time to go from being rhetorical and talking about it to actually right. doing things. Right. So I, I very much want those who are committed to doing something about this right now to, to let us know, to let Dee know, to, to make it sure that when she leaves here, she has a sense of security. So um, thank you, Dee. So uh, we, we got going, y'all. I told you it was going to be a hot conversation, didn't I? So we're, we're just going to take like a, a range of questions, like whatever we can get in, we're going to just have like several. And then I'll let the panel answer the ones that they're moved to as part of their final comments on where we should go from here. Does that work for everyone? OK, some questions. Thank you. Good evening, ladies. I just wanted to say thank you so much for the panel. The divine feminine is certainly in the house. I am living the situation right now as we speak. I was drugged and sexually assaulted by a coworker. Um, I did report it at the time. I have now come forward to a company, the company that I work for and come to find out that the women that run the company um, knew that it happened. And I'm now in a place where how do, how do you know when to come forward? How do I find assistance to try to deal with this? I do need to work. I have been off for a bit, going back to work soon. But I, I'm just trying to find my real true voice. Am I supposed to come public about this, try to work with this out with them, and I'm so grateful. I found out about um, this event an hour before it started, and I knew I had to be here. Thank you all Thank so you. much. Thank you for sharing. We're happy you're here. Uh, Thank you. I think that you should uh, go above, find, find, go to the top. You can't, I mean, it's like a, it's like a ladder, so to speak. So you went to these women, these women are in charge, but who's in charge of those women? You know what I mean? You have to go above them because I feel like because they know and they're so involved in protecting whatever is happening, you need to go above them. Um, to it's the women at the top. Can I, can I just make a suggestion? Um, I think the best thing that's come out of Time's Up is the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. We raised $22 million for people like you to apply for pro bono uh, legal representation. Um, if they take your case, they'll take it all the way. There's been, uh, I think, 3,000 applicants. There's hundreds of active cases from class action to individual lawsuits. So I, I would go down that path if you don't feel like being confrontational with the people you work with and you just want to have some support. Let me take several questions and then let the... Uh panel answer yes I have one yes um both Beverly and Dee filed lawsuits against your perpetrators what has happened with those lawsuits I never filed a lawsuit against Bill Cosby he filed a lawsuit against me to silence me okay go ahead and ask your question um hi um I guess I can't make the commendation, but the fact that you were able to say this, my experience isn't devalued by me being able to be empathetic with things I don't understand from my experience, I resonate with that so much, and I think that that was very, very powerful that you were able to do that. But my question is, um, are there any practical or like ways we can apply conversation in talking about these issues with our loved ones? You know, like with, you know, terms like misogyny, toxic masculinity are now kind of being in memes and things like that. Um, but now I also hear, um, well, for me, wanting to talk about this with men, they're like, well, now all I hear is toxic masculinity. I'm being attacked. Now I'm being attacked. It's just how can we practically have these conversations not in academia and with our uncles? 
our brothers, our cousins, our loved ones, are there any suggestions that you would have that we can apply walking out of this uh, forum? Wonderful. Two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, hi, so I'm a UCLA student finishing up this year, thank God, um, but um, during my time at UCLA I've been heavily involved in a lot of black activist spaces and I've noticed that within those spaces there is a lot of misogynoir, a lot of abuse, and specifically a lot of protectors of abuse, and um, in trying to combat this I've seen that most of the people that are perpetuating this are the ones who are screaming so loudly about support black women, protect black women, using all the buzzwords and all the other hotepery, whatever that they want to use. I'll take that question. <laughs> Thank you. Hotepery, um, a word, right. a word. Yeah, so I mean, basically my question is just how do you combat that when the persona that they, you know, give out is just some like pseudo intersectionality ally, basically. Uh-oh, all right. I got you. Thank you. Uh, one more. Um, uh. Next question is, Sorry, mind? I lost okay. my train of thought. Oh, my so bad. I wanted to ask about what is being done or how does the movement, whether it's Time's Up, Me Too, et cetera, as we're talking about including more black women. Um, in a lot of these movements, I oftentimes feel like we don't, we don't talk enough about class. And um, Dee's story you know, really hit home for me because a lot of times, mm -hmm. take your time. excuse me. Take your time, take your time. the economic impact, right, of constantly having to go through these situations. It's so much more, I, I was reading a statistic the other day that, um, you know, in the fight for 15 and the fact that, you know, it's, it's black women and it's queer black women who are most at risk for being economically disenfran disenfranchised when we have low wages, and that's one thing. But when you, you literally can't work, right? When you are, when you have experienced, um, when you have experienced sexual assault and you have experienced these things that literally pull you out of the workforce, mm -hmm. right? You can't, you can't go to work. Mm -hmm. You can't hold on a job for any extended period of time. And so it's not just the money that you lose by not working. You also, you know, lose whatever, um, experience you can be gaining to move forward mm. in your career and sorry I don't want to keep going on but basically how do we what is being done to to include more of our stories in that because as much as I want to say like with time's up and you know a lot of these movements that are happening as much as I'm so grateful that black women are um, being moved to the center of the conversation we don't pay attention to poor women mm. and we don't pay attention to low-income women mm. And we are the ones that have the least resources mm -hmm. to be able to talk about what's happening to us. You know, I mean, I have stories for days about how, how race and, and, and class and, you know, sexual assault in, intersect to, sure. to, to really pull it back. But I just want to know, like, what's being done to include poor black women in the stories of black women moving forward? Because it feels like we're not being included. So we have a whole template of questions, and we're at the, the moment of more or less summing up. So um, let me just throw a spin on these. So one of the goals of this is to think forward, moving from this moment, how we, how we incorporate all of these aspects of sexual assault, sexual violence, gender-based violence, what's our imaginary about moving forward. Some of it has to do with how we articulate issues. Some of it has to do with how we represent, right? The question of um, who's at the center of this narrative. Some of it is about allyship. What, what would we have wanted in some of these stories our sisters to have said and done? What would we have wanted to be in place? So as you ponder uh, your reactions to and responses to some of these questions, just thinking forward, what would have made a difference for you that you would like to see come into that? Well, the Cosby uh, victims did make a difference. 
um, there was a seven-year statute of limitation for sexual assault. There is no limitation. They lobbied in Congress, and now there is no limitation on sexual assault. Wow. Okay. Um, not to use. I, 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 I work with children in a um, Barbara Sinatra Center for um, Abused Children. And you see 10, 11, 12-year-old girls and boys that have been raped and, and just, just horrific stories. But the one thing that um, I hear from them is that I wish my mother would believe me. Oh. And it's, it's that kind of, of acknowledgement that, they, that they, yearn, they yearn for. So I don't know if that. And you're doing work. Yes. So just quick 15 seconds about what you're doing and where people can get involved. So uh, it's, it's a center in, in where I live out in uh, Palm Springs. And um, Barbara Sinatra, who passed away uh, um, a couple of years ago, has this center free charge for, and they literally take the child from the home, from the police station to the center. And, you know, they... Um, start a healing process with therapists and so on and so forth. And I do a self-esteem class, and I get to know these, these children. And that was another reason I had to speak out. Here are these, these brave little kids that are really dealing with these horrific acts done by their grandfathers, done by their fa and that I, I, I could not speak out about what happened to me. Um, so um, I, I feel very, I, I sit on the board, and for me, my grandchildren, and the animated um, uh, movies about good touch, bad touch for children. I think we really have to instill in our children, my grandsons, on on, on their behavior with with women or with or with you know keep your hands to yourself basically, mm -hmm. and your and your body is your body, mm -hmm. and 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 just those kind of the messages that I think we should Thank do with you. children. Thank you, D. Sexual assault, abuse, gender-based violence has class effects, right? Oh, yo, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, for me, it's, uh, and when I say me, I, you know, I, I just don't mean to center it around myself, but I, I'm just uh, pulling from my own personal experience. But um, to, to break the code of silence, to uh, stop the stigma of standing up and speaking out um, and restorative justice. Those are, the, those are like the three most important things to what, me. I, what would restorative justice be for you? Restorative justice for me personally would be for me to be able to work in the industry that I was working in. Um, I was told to give it up, let it go. And I'm not talking about the incident, I'm talking about my career. Why do I have to give up my career? I didn't attack anyone. I stood up for myself, but it seems to be uh, an immediate backlash for women. As we were talking about the Dr. Ford, um, this woman came up, testified in the Kavanaugh hearings. She had to move. Uh, she received death threats. She had to move her family several times. She has to have security. Um, she had to change her job. She had to leave the teaching job she loved. Maybe she's teaching somewhere else, but she had to leave the job there. And it shouldn't be like that. So I'm trying to figure out how, how to move forward in that space where women do not have to lose their power um, holding people in positions of power accountable. Mm -hmm. right. So that's, you know, that's, that's the focus I'm on. And this woman right here who asked me about uh, this lawsuit, the lawsuit... Uh, we did bring up a lawsuit, uh, my record company, myself, um, and it the, the trial went on for two years. No one knows this. So two years of my life, I can't get back. Um, and I went to practically every court date. He only went to two. So I was just there by myself, no support. My mother was with me, thank God. She lost her job being there with me. Um, but... There was no, I had no one in the hip hop community, no no one. Um, there were some women around me. I'm not gonna say that. There were some women around me that supported me when it first happened and surrounded me with a sister love, but they weren't there with me during the in the trenches during the the court the court battle. So um, 
for me to answer your question, restorative justice would be for me to be able to work and sustain a living um, doing what I love and not having to give that up because I held someone in a position of power accountable. Thank you. Kenya, talk about the whole tips. Okay. <laughs> So I want to, I never thought I would ever read this again, but I'm just going to read this really quickly, and then I think it will address what you're saying. So this came to me from someone who deems himself as a pan-African leader, okay? So this is someone that people follow. So this is, and Rashida, here's a shout-out to you too. The white organization backing Time's Up and Mute R. Kelly is using R. Kelly, hold on, come back using R. Kelly as a proxy to demonstrate, to demonize all black men in an effort to push and see black men abuse black woman narrative. So here's my response. You're tripping. <laughs> <laughs> I learned from Jamila. And dangerous. The very fact that you completely centered black men's oppression to black women's sexual violence tells me just how much of a fuck you do not give about us. You are part of the problem. So I, you read that? <laughs> I think I hit the like button. You hit the like button. Now what's really sad about this set of tweets is that his tweet got 306 retweets and 633 likes. Mine got four retweets and 19 likes. So I said that to make to, to your point. Yes, we have a hotel problem. So let's talk about what we do when, and in some of those retweets and, and tweets, those were black women. In this campaign, I have received more vitriol from black women. I have been threatened. I have been maligned. Um, several weeks ago, and I was very open about this, um, my, my canine companion went over the Rainbow Bridge. And many of you who have pets understand that I, I'm okay. I didn't cry only once today. I cried. But this was someone that was very, I mean, this was my spiritual, you know, companion. And I was open and I was vulnerable about that. And I posted about that on Twitter. Someone was so upset that I was holding R. Kelly accountable, they attacked my dog's euthanasia, and said, you should have been put down with your bitch because you're just as much of a bitch as she is. Now, fortunately, Twitter found it before I found it and blocked the person's account and reported them. And, 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 but, but it's that degree of vitriol that happens just because you want to stand in a space to hold people accountable. So yes, to that question about black women who Anybody can put on a head wrap and, and a dashiki. And I'll say this. Sometimes our aunties, <laughs> you're okay. Sometimes <laughs> our aunties wear lipsticks and sometimes they're wolves. And you got to be able to discern. I teach my 13-year-old daughter discernment. Everyone who comes to you is not going to look like a monster. They're going to look like you in most cases. It is discernment. It is listening with your gut. It is listening with your intuition. It is when that little twinge happens and you know it's not right, that's when you get out of the situation. I have walked out of many conversations of black women who profess to be about black women and girls, and they lead these stories. And here's for me, and I'll, I'll pass the mic, but this is, this is passionate for me. Um, I, if I would give you a piece of advice, young sister, Anytime you walk into a space with black women and we're talking about sexual violence, human trafficking, especially sex trafficking, or anything of that nature, and they lead with, you got to have better self-esteem. Ah. That, to me, is the red flag. Because it is completely, that is victim blaming in another term. To to take the, the responsibility off of sexual violence, off the predator, and put it on a child. That is what that call for self-esteem is really about. I've walked out of so many meetings because they want black girls to learn self-esteem and wear longer skirts and not show cleavage and not twerk. A twerk has never gotten any, a twerk has never raped anybody. 
rapist rape people. So what I would say to that is the respectability politics the talks about self-esteem and raising your self-esteem, that to me, for me, when black women enter this space and they start with that conversation, I tune them out as if they're speaking in, in, so speaking in Greek. I can't even hear it anymore. Sorry. I'm sorry. Drop that mic. Drop the mic. Yes. Jamila. Um, to the question about uh, how do we have these conversations in more intimate settings in particular, or even in groups of friends or in a classroom, you know, I, I've had some intense uh, exchanges with people on social media, and I've certainly had some very intense ones with people offline as well, where I do spend most of my life. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there is a difference in, in the tone in the established relationship. I know this person, so this could be one of my parents, this could be you know, a, a lover, a, someone who I've been friends with for a really long time, or a friend of a friend, or someone in a bar. But when you're looking someone eye to eye, it's not about not having the courage to pop off and snap out, it's just that that's not, and <laughs> that's, not what we it, that, that, that's not the appropriate venue for that, right? It's like, I'm, I have an opportunity to get through to you. Because when I argue with trolls online, it's, it's not about them. They're not going to get it. Right, these are people, if you're at the point where you want to say awful things to all of these women on this stage right. because we are choosing to hold people accountable. It's one thing to say I disagree with your methodology. It's one thing to say I disagree with maybe what you're saying, right? You, even I want to dispute certain facts. But when it becomes, I'm, I'm gonna say awful things about your dog, or I'm gonna say awful things about your children, or I'm gonna say that person that you just quoted, Implicated my father in the murder of Fred Hampton. Exactly. Because he does not like my tweets about R. Kelly, right? Like, so the level of hatred that exists for us for wanting accountability from not, you know, noble, upstanding, beloved members of the community who have labored tirelessly on our behalf and we're struggling to understand how do we reconcile. No, an entertainer that gave some money to a school and then told black people to pull their pants up or and stop having sex with their grandmother. Right, that was it or a washed up R&B singer. So if you'll go this hard for them, what happens when it's somebody who's really earned our love right. in a meaningful way, right? What do you do when it is someone at home? It, it's about making the language as plain and as accessible as possible. You know, if someone is new to some of this discourse, saying, you know, cishet and sex positivity and heteronormativity, you know, you have to walk somebody into that, right? Like, you have to make sure that they understand the words that are coming out of your mouth. And you can speak to those concepts. You certainly must speak to those concepts. You have to say, look, things impact black straight men differently than they impact black gay men, differently than they impact black women. You know, black queer women versus black straight women. You know, you're, you're still talking about all those groups of people, but you're, you know, you're bite-sizing it. And, and sometimes you do have to be a little bit more, not conciliatory, but just like, hey, I understand this is hard to hear. Or, hey, look, I, just be clear. I'm not disparaging what you go through. Right. You know, you have to make that clear. And I think that people who've actually taken the time to read the work, again, of any of these people on this stage and the work that we cite, and look to to guide uh, what we do, there's never been a lack of empathy never. for our brothers. There's never been a, a point in, in the majority of black feminist thought where there was talk of a, a parting of ways or saying we're not dealing with you anymore. We think we'd be better off with other partners and we'd be better off not considering you all brothers. So long as we continue to have children, no matter who we have them with, we are going to produce black sons. Right, and, and so, and most of us came from black fathers, and even if that isn't our experience, we love our black men and boys. Even those of us who do this work have to struggle with not loving them so much that we allow you know, certain things to go unchecked because it, doing the checking hurts so badly. Yeah. But again, it, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of grace, um, right. and, and just understanding that nothing that they've encountered in their life prior to having this conversation with you They've ne there's a chance that they've never been told these things directly. Right, right, thank you. Thank you, Rashida. Um, yes, to, to your point about uh, poor women, uh, and, and this is not lip service, I'm just talking about it in broad terms, so 
Time's Up really started because the Farm Workers Alliance wrote a letter to the women in Hollywood saying, we see you, we hear you, we share your pain, and thank you for speaking up, and we're all suffering the same um, inequality and assault and abuse and harassment, which was incredibly generous and empathetic for them to do. And I think it was then that women in Hollywood were like, we're in a privileged position, and Anybody who's, any women that are marginalized, any survivors that are marginalized and don't have the resources will be the most victimized. And that is very much inclusive of socioeconomic class. That, I mean, that's, that is 100% the case. Again, not to point to the League of Defense Fund, but there's a class action lawsuit against McDonald's, there's a class action lawsuit against Walmart. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, legal action being taken, but, you know, there is this really tricky balance between we have to try to clean up our own backyard. I mean, Hollywood is a mess. It's a mess in terms of representation. It's a mess in terms of harassment. It's a, it's a mess. The numbers are a mess. When you look at the people who are directing movies, there's two black women. Like, there was two last year in, in the, you know, whatever, top 100 movies. So I think we're trying to hold ourselves accountable in a way that, that can model in, in a larger way to all, all other types of systems and all other types of businesses and at the same time continue to partner with the Farm Workers Alliance, the Domestic Workers Alliance, um, other organizations that have been doing this work for a really long time and try to support them in the work they're already doing to, to really support you know, the class of women that they represent and they try to protect. So, you know, I, I hear you and and you're right. Like it's hearing the stories that I've heard from farm workers who, you know, get threatened by their bosses, you have to have sex with me or I'll have you deported. It's a very different situation than having your butt pinched on a set. Yeah. I'm very aware of that privilege and, and I don't take it for granted and I don't think, you know, I don't think any of the women that I've, I work with do not take that for granted and, and I hear you and I see you and I hope that more can be done in that area. Thank you. Stephanie. So I just wanted to, um, I guess, wrap up by talking about um, a, a group um, that we rarely ever think about when we talk about sexual assault when, when in the context of black women's lives and experiences, and that's queer black women, and, and the young lady mentioned that before. And I, I, I talk about that because um, when we listen to victims and we listen to all victims, what becomes really clear is that the individuals they identify as perpetrators sometimes don't look like the individuals we have in mind. And that could be, in fact, a, a black female partner that could be, in fact, enacting this, this, these acts, you know, these, these um, in instances of sexual assault. So I think we need to listen to all victims, and that means that we also listen to um, victims when they talk about who their perpetrators are, in spite of the fact that we have in our minds, you know, particular ideas of who those individuals would be. And I think that that will expand the conversation so that we can, you know, really, I think, combat this issue more broadly for, for all women involved. Thank you, Stephanie. So I, I told y'all it was going to be a hot conversation. I told you that it was a long overdue. Please join me in thanking Stephanie, Rashida, Jamelia, Kenyette, Dee, and Beverly. And if you like this conversation, um, first of all, um, like us uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Look for this conversation as part of the Intersectionality Matters podcast and come back tomorrow. We're going to talk about Harriet's political will. We're going to have a play headlining Lisa Gay Hamilton. We're going to have Alicia Garza in the house. We're going to have Barbara Arnwine in the house. We're going to have other women who are going to talk about black women's political, uh, black women's political will. And Thursday, say her name, the lives that should have been. We're going to pay tribute to all of the black women who've been killed by the police. We're going to have their mothers here. We're going to have a play. And we're going to have a conversation about how to move forward. So uh, please follow us. Please like us. Please come and hang out with us. And thank you for joining us here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.